you've probably come across Venn diagrams as a way of using circle diagrams to do calculations in set theory. They were introduced by John Venn in the late 19th century, not for set theory in general, but as a way of doing calculations in Aristotle's logic of syllogisms. You may also have heard that Venn wasn't the first person to use diagrams to do syllogisms. In fact, there are other kinds of diagram for syllogisms going back to the late 17th century. What you probably haven't heard is that there were already excellent diagrams for doing Aristotelian logic several hundred years earlier than that. This talk is going to be about the diagrams proposed by a rabbi in Baghdad in the middle of the 12th century. His name was Abu al-Barakat al-Baghdadi. I'll just call him al-Barakat for short. To explain his diagrams, we'll need to start with some slides on Aristotle's logic. Aristotle produced his logic in the 4th century BC in Greek. The part of his logic that we'll be concerned with uses four kinds of sentence which are as follows, translated into English. Every A is a B. No A is a B. Some A is a B. And some A is not a B. You're allowed to replace A and B by any two distinct letters but you can't have the same letter twice, like every M is an M. The way that Al-Barakat read these sentences for his diagram method is that the letters stand for sets. And these sentences describe ways that the sets can be related to each other. For example, every A is a B says that every element of the set A is an element of the set B. And some A is a B says that some element of the, the set A is an element of the set B. Al-Barakat also assumes, not all traditional logicians assume this, but Al-Barakat does in his method, he assumes that the sets we're talking about are non-empty. That means that the set A contains some element and there's at least one thing in the set B and so on. Aristotle is interested in arguments that he calls syllogisms. For our purposes and also for our Barakat's purposes, a syllogism consists of three sentences with the following properties. The first sentence uses the letters A and B in some order. It could be A first, it could be B first. The second sentence uses the letters B and C in some order. Again, it could be either way around. The third sentence has first letter A and second letter C. That order is fixed. One more requirement and that is that the third sentence follows from, or can be deduced or inferred from, the other first two sentences. And to express that, we write therefore in front of the third sentence. The first two sentences in the syllogism are called the premises of the syllogism, and the third sentence is called its conclusion. The two premises together are said to be a premise pair. So here's an example of an Aristotelian syllogism. Every A is a B, every B is a C, therefore every A is a C. Sounds plausible. But there is a small subtlety here. From these two premises you can also deduce some A is a C. Should we count both every A is a C and some A is a C as conclusions? Both Aristotle and Al-Barakat adopted the convention that in cases like this, 
the conclusion is the stronger of the two candidate sentences. In this case, every A is a C. In the same way, if both no A is a C and some A is not a C are available as conclusions, the convention is that you choose no A is a C, which is the stronger statement. Is a slightly trickier syllogism. Every B is an A, some B is not a C. Does anything follow? Yep. Therefore, some A is not a C. Stare at it for a moment and see if you agree. Now, if you write down a premise pair where the first sentence has the letters A and B in some order and the second sentence has the letters B and C in some order, it's not necessarily true that there is a sentence that follows from them both. For example, suppose we write some A is a B and some C is a B. Does that imply any of the four sentences that have the letter A first and the letter C second? Again, you might like to stare at that for a moment and see if you agree with me that there is no such sentence. By the time of our barricade, it had become the custom to say that a premise pair is sterile if it doesn't have a conclusion. In other words, if it can't be completed to form a syllogism. If it can be completed to form a syllogism, then we say it's productive with such and such a conclusion. Now, our barricade's method is designed to do the following thing. If you're given a pair of premises, then you can use the method to find out whether this premise pair is sterile or productive. And if it's productive, you can use the method to find out what its conclusion is. Right, so now let's look at our Barakat's method. His method uses what he calls diagrams Diagram in Arabic is surah, which is still a very common word in modern Arabic, usually means photograph. His diagrams consist of three horizontal lines with letters attached. If you look at this text, it's from a manuscript of al barakats book, down the right-hand side of the page there are three words which are the Arabic for first, second and third. So there are three diagrams here, and each of the diagrams, as you can see, consists of three horizontal lines. There are various pieces of text attached to the lines, but the important text for us is at the top right of the lines, where there's an Arabic letter, which is the Arabic equivalent of either A or B or C. Al Barakat uses these diagrams to represent the relationships between the non-empty sets A, B and C. To explain the possible relationships, we'll go first to the case of two lines with two letters. This is what Al Barakat himself does. For each possibility, he asks, which of the sentences are true in this case? If the diagram makes a sentence true, we will say that the diagram is a model of the sentence. A model of a premise pair is a diagram that's a model of both the sentences in the pair. In other words, it makes both her premises true. The word model here is modern terminology. Al Barakat expresses the same thing in other words. For example, he talks about the diagram setting out the facts. Al Barakat finds that every pair of non-empty sets falls 
under just one of five cases. Let's look at the five cases that he finds. The first case is that A and B are the same set, A equals B. There are two ways of writing this. One is to have the line for A immediately above the line for B, and they're the same length, and neither sticks out beyond the other. The other way of writing it is just the same, except that B is above A. These two diagrams are models of, in other words, they make true, every A is a B, some A is a B, every B is an A, and some B is an A. The second case is where, as the set theorists say, A is a proper subset of B. That means that every element of A is an element of B, but not vice versa. And the diagrams show A and B on separate lines. The A line doesn't stick out beyond the B line, but the B line does stick out beyond the A line. On the sheet, you'll see three diagrams to illustrate this case. All of these diagrams are models of every A is a B, some A is a B, some B is an A, and some B is not an A. The third case is exactly the same as the second case, except that the letters are the other way around. So this case is that B is a proper subset of A. In other words, every element of B is an element of A, but not vice versa. The fourth case is that no element of A is an element of B. Or equivalently, no element of B is an element of A. The set theorists describe this case by saying that A and B are disjoint. This case has several diagrams and what they have in common is that there's no overlap between the A line and the B line. Each of these diagrams is a model of no A is a B, some A is not a B, no B is an A, and some B is not an A. The fifth case is that A and B do have an overlap, but there's some of A that's not in B and some of B that's not in A. There are several diagrams in this case, and I leave it to you to work out what sentences these diagrams are models of. You can more or less read that off from the definition of the case. Now we've seen that in all five cases there are several diagrams. But as far as our barricade is concerned, two diagrams of the same case count as the same diagram. So in his way of counting, there are exactly five diagrams. A historical point here is that these five cases were rediscovered in 1816 by a famous French mathematician called Joseph Gergon. Gergon did it a bit differently from our barricade. He didn't choose horizontal lines, instead he used circles and parts of circles. Some of that has come down into the modern notation for set theory. In case two, where we have one set, a proper subset of another, Gergon wrote in French, continu, it's a French for contained. And he took the capital C at the beginning of contenu and used that as a symbol for this case. You can see that a capital C is quite like the symbol that the set theorists still use for set inclusion. So, how does our Barakat use his diagrams for handling syllogisms? Remember that a syllogism has three sentences, so it's got three letters standing for three non-empty sets. Now we saw that there are five cases of two non-empty sets. 
when we've got three non-empty sets, the number of possible cases goes up sharply from 5 to 109. That's quite a large number, but um, let's hope it's manageable. We'll start with our Barakat's criterion for proving productivity. His idea is, if a premise pair has a conclusion, then every model of the premise pair will be a model of the conclusion. And vice versa, except that we have to remember that point about taking the strongest conclusion. So the instructions are that given our premise pair, we first make a list of all the diagrams that are models of the premise pair. And we look through the list to see whether there's any sentence with first letter A and second letter C, which is true in all these diagrams. If there is, then we know that we've got a productive premise pair. Now there's a useful mathematical fact here. Every productive premise pair has at most 16 models. So if you're making your list of models and you find you've got 17, then you can be sure that your premise pair is sterile. If you still want to carry on proving that it's sterile by al barakats method, then you need to look ahead a little bit to al barakats method for proving sterility, which we'll come to in a moment. So here's an example of proving productivity. Our premise pair is every A is a B, no B is a C. And we start by finding all the models of this premise pair. Well, we've seen that no B is a C has just one model. It's where the two lines have no overlap. The sentence every A is a B has two models depending on whether we take A equal to B or just a part of B. There are two ways of getting models of the whole premise pair by fitting together a model of the first premise and a model of the second. And I've written them out for you there on the sheet labeled example one. If you look at these two diagrams, you'll see that in both of them, no A is a C. The lines for A and C have no overlap. So we've proved by Barakat's method that this premise pair is productive and has conclusion no A is a C. Aristotle already considered this case and came to the same conclusion. But Aristotle reckoned that this case was so obvious that it didn't need a proof. In fact, we could take it as a kind of axiom. But our Barakat insisted that we should have a proof, and the proof that he gave is the one that I've just given you. Next, we come to our Barakat's method for proving that a premise pair is sterile, i.e. it doesn't have a conclusion. His method is as follows. We produce three diagrams that are models of the premises with the following properties. The first model of the premises is also a model of every A is a C. The second model of the premises is also a model of no A is a C. And the third model of the premises is also a model of some A is a C and some A is not a C. Our Barakat claims correctly that we can find three such models if and only if the premise pair is sterile. Now there's a useful mathematical fact here too. Our Barakat should have known it, but he doesn't actually say it anywhere. If you can find a model of the premises that makes every A is a C true, and also a model of the premises that makes no A is a C true, 
then you can always find a third model that makes some A is a C and some A is not a C true. So we don't need to find all three of our Barakat's models. We only need the first two. And I'm going to assume that we just work with the first two. Here's an example. See the sheet headed example two. Premise pair, no B is an A, every B is a C. Now we know that the sentence, no B is an A, has just one diagram where the lines for A and B don't overlap. And every B is a C has two models. One of them is where B equals C and the other is where B overlaps C, but C sticks out a bit on one side or the other. Now, can we combine these models of the two premises so as to get a model of every A is a C? Well, if you think about it, it is quite clear that we can. You write down lines for A and B not overlapping because no B is an A. And then you take the line for C to run all the way along over the top so that A and B both lie inside. In that case, you get a model of the two premises and it's also a model of every A is a C. On the other hand, you can shrink C down so that it just covers B and it doesn't overlap with A at all. In that case, you've got no A is a C and it's still a model of the two premises. So we've got the first two kinds of model as required by our Barakat's method. And that shows that the premise pair is sterile. Next, I've chosen two examples where I reckon you probably can't see straight off whether the premise pair is going to be sterile or productive. Now, in cases where you just don't know whether you're aiming for a proof of sterility or a proof of productiveness, there's a heuristic. That means a piece of advice. And this is from me, not from our Barakat. In these cases, where you just don't know where you're headed for, it's sensible to try proving sterility first. And the reason for that is that to prove sterility, you need to find just two objects to a particular kinds of diagram. Whereas if you're trying to prove productiveness, it's more complicated and you have to look for more things in general. In the first example, the premise pair is no A is a B, some C is not a B. This is example three on the sheet. The sentence, some C is not a B, is not one that we've used in our examples so far. It has three models. As you see here on the sheet, there's a part of C that doesn't overlap with B at all, but then you have complete freedom whether the rest of C overlaps B partly or altogether or not at all. So we want to fit one of these diagrams together with the diagram of no A is a B to get a model of every A is a C. And here's how you do it. Also, we want to find a way of combining one of these diagrams for the second premise with a diagram for the first premise so as to get a model of no A is a C. This is also very easy. So we found the two models that we needed to find to show that the premise pair is sterile. The other example, example four, is every B is an A, some C is a B. Now again, the sentence some C is a B is the kind of sentence that we haven't used in our examples yet. It has four kinds of model. 
which are listed in the sheet, for example, 4. Now that means that there are lots of ways that C and B could be related to each other to make the sentence true. And that's liable to make the argument more complicated. But let's try it. It's quite easy to find a model of both premises that makes every A is a C true. The easiest way to do it is just to take A equals B equals C. Then you get a model of both premises and you also get a model of every A is a C. What about finding a model of no A is a C? You have to stop and think a little here. We know that some C is a B, that's the second premise. Well, let's consider some part of the set C that lies inside the set B. We also know from the first premise that every B is an A. So that part of the set C also lies inside A. And that tells us that some C is an A. Now you can see that there's a symmetry here. If some C is an A, then some A is a C. So we've shown that if the premises are true, then some A is a C. And what that tells us is that every model of the premises is also a model of some A is a C. And that shows that some A is a C is a conclusion from those premises. So we've shown that the two premises are productive and that we can deduce from them the conclusion some A is a C. Now this is a place where we come to that point I mentioned earlier, that there might be two different sentences that we could deduce from the premises and we need to know which of them to choose as the conclusion. Well, let's check it. The sentence that we might also be able to prove from the premises is every A is a C, which is a stronger statement than some A is a C. If we could prove every A is a C, then we should choose that one as the conclusion and not some A is a C. However, we go back to the diagrams and we check. Is it true that every model of the premises is a model of every A is a C? If you scratch around for a little, you'll soon find that that's not so. Here's a diagram on the sheet, which is a model of both premises and is not a model of every A is a C. As you can see, A has a bit sticking out that doesn't overlap C. So in this case, we don't have to make a choice. The conclusion can only be some A is a C. There's a curious thing here. We started this example by trying to prove that the premise pair is sterile. But we finished up proving that it's productive. This happens quite often in mathematics. You set out to prove one thing, and in the course of working on it, you realize you can't prove it, and the reason why you can't prove it can be turned into a proof of the opposite. On the next sheet here, I've written out one, two, three, four, five more examples that you can use as exercises for using our Barakat's method. Well, that's it. That's our Barakat's method for determining, given a categorical premise pair, whether the premise pair is sterile or productive, and if it's productive, what conclusion it has. But you might want to follow up one or two other features of our Barakat's diagrams. They're interesting things. I've put in three sheets that mention some topics connected with them. The first sheet is to correct a false impression I've probably given you. I said there are 109 cases of relationships between three 
non-empty sets A, B and C. That's correct. But not every one of these relationships can be drawn by Al Barakat's kind of diagram. That's because of the topology of the plane that you're making the drawing on. I've put on the sheet a slightly mathematical example. If you try to draw a diagram of it, you'll see straight away what goes wrong here and why we can't use straight line diagrams to represent this case. Now that does raise a question. Our Barakat only uses diagrams that he can draw. Now say when he's proving productivity, the idea behind his proof is that every model of the premises is a model of the conclusion. And he only shows that for those models that can be drawn. Could there perhaps be other models that can't be drawn that are models of the premises but not of the conclusion? If there are, then his method would just give wrong answers. Well, the good news is that we can prove that his method always gives correct answers in spite of the fact that it limits itself to diagrams that can be drawn. By the way, the number of diagrams that can be drawn for non-empty sets A, B and C is 86. So there are 23 rogue relationships that can't be drawn. The second remark goes back to what I said at the beginning, that a better known way of using diagrams for Aristotle's logic is Venn diagrams. Now you might think from what I've said that Al Barakat's diagrams are an early form of Venn diagrams. This is not correct. They're based on a completely different idea. As Venn himself made clear, his diagrams were intended to put Aristotle's arguments into a pictorial form. So his diagrams represented sentences, not models. With our Barakat, it's the other way around. His diagrams represent models and not sentences. And we've seen many times in this talk that there is not a one-to-one -one correspondence between sentences and models. In fact, Al Barakat's method is an anticipation, but it's not an anticipation of Venn. It's an anticipation of Alfred Tarski's model theoretic consequence, which he set out very carefully in a paper in the 1930s. Tarski was completely unaware that Al Barakat had got there earlier, but Tarski did the thing more precisely and in much greater generality than Al Barakat did. Third remark. You might be wondering if what Al Barakat has given us is a mechanical procedure for determining sterile or productive. In other words, whether he's given us a decision algorithm for Aristotle's logic. The answer is yes and no. From what Al Barakat does, it's very easy to write a computer program that will follow Al Barakat's method. So there is a decision algorithm in there. But Al Barakat himself doesn't talk that way. He proceeded very much as we've done in this talk, using the diagrams as an aid to thinking about the possible models. So he allows you to use any kind of reasoning to get the answer using the diagrams as a help to see what's going on. Now, the medieval Arabic mathematicians and the logicians described several algorithms. The most famous of them is Al-Khwarizmi's quadratic algorithm for solving quadratic equations. And in fact, his name, Al-Khwarizmi, is the basis of the word algorithm. But as far as I can tell, these Arabic scholars never made any connection between the different algorithms that they produced. They never said all of these things are algorithms. They seem not to have had the idea of a mechanical procedure. I've put a reference in here to an essay that follows this up a bit. 
but there may, well, there may well be some evidence out there that I don't know about and you do. In which case, please let me know. I'll say goodbye now. <laughs>